Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Go check out Pacific War Podcast, week by week. Hosted by yours truly, Craig Watson, in association with Kings and Generals. Found on all podcast platforms, like Spotify. Give it a click. You'll like it. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the entire Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. Yet again, this is a podcast associated with the previous episode, which would have been Japan during World War I. And I'm here with two guests featuring Justin. What's up, everybody? And Eric. Hello. Many of you watching might have seen eric or heard him in uh, the previous podcast we did i think it would have been uh out of hong kong it's a while back yeah yeah i think yeah. it has been some time all right so for those uh, who are coming maybe from kings and generals and this is the first time you're hearing my podcast of which the majority of the audience seems to be coming from kings and generals so i try and do this with all these new episodes uh, the idea behind this podcast is it follows my YouTube series. So if you're an audio listener, that's great. Uh, you basically get the full YouTube episode in an audio format followed by this discussion. Otherwise, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you'd have to watch the uh, previous YouTube episode and then you watch this. And it's a discussion on basically anything that didn't make it into the episode, uh, what guests that are invited to the podcast thought of the episode, maybe the questions they have. And then I answer audience questions. That's more or less the gist of it. And I might talk about future projects, who knows? So, stating that, both of uh, my guests have seen the episode, which was uh, Japan during World War I. Uh, I'll start with Justin. Uh, what did you think? And uh, what questions might you have on it? There was an episode to watch. We're done here. Uh, that, no. It's been the Joe Rogan experience. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I thought the episode was very good. Uh, definitely a few things I picked up on that I thought were a bit weird or I, I didn't really understand the motivation behind it, mm-hmm. but uh, that stuff we can delve into a little bit later as to certain moves Japan made, uh, certain places they went for reasons that I can't understand, but uh, it's interesting to see the, the kind of, the, I don't want to say the shift in allegiance, but you know, you can definitely tell they're sort of playing both sides of the fence and deciding who they want to align with for the foreseeable future. So kind of interesting to see that dynamic going on between Japan and the USA, Japan and Germany, uh, Russia, and all these things. It's uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to watch it unfold. Yeah, definitely. World War One was a focal point where things kind of got switched and got a little bit more murky. You know, Japan was always on the fence when it came to Russia because Russia was the number one rival for uh, the modern part of history. But then the United States kind of snuck its way into becoming that rife, that rival as well. And as you see with World War I, Japan is basically under the whole premise that they could be attacked at any moment by the Americans. And they use that as a justification for, you know, not doing certain things until they're kind of pushed around a bit. And then at the end half of World War I, they uh, end up being allies with the United States, which was really awkward for them. Yeah. And uh, Eric, what did you think about the episode and uh, any and or questions? Well, with most of my experience being in World War II, I don't know much about Japan World War I. After watching this video, the one thing that really stuck out for me was just the difference. The difference in the ideology of Japan of World War I. Completely different. Not not to go into World War II, but just to bring to the point of like how it shifted, how like... Japan in World War One was more of a, how should I say, not morally righteous because they <laughs> did do a lot of fucked up shit, but they were more in line with nineteenth century values. gentry. I find, like, yeah, they, yeah, they were like, hold, like trying to really uphold to the old rules of war and engagement. Yeah, exactly. That's what really stuck out to me was just how they 
undertook war in World War One, whereas in World War Two, we all know the complete 180 that <laughs> Japan took from those two. But that's why I was watching this video. I was very insightful because I didn't know much on J Japan in that time. Like I knew they did. It was mostly um, uh, they were pr protecting convoys. They were uh, sailing and uh, hunting down the, the German raiding groups and that. That was mostly of what I knew. But I like I didn't know they were in the Mediterranean. That I thought they specifically stayed in the the Pacific or especially the Southeast Pacific that area. So the fact that they actually and to learn that uh, for them going to the Mediterranean, then they got access to all of the German colonies was very insightful. On top of that, learning that I always thought they just had the colonies. I didn't realize. Yeah, I know Britain being Britain and like so all these German colonies. Japan wanted for themselves because it was technically in, you know, their neck of the woods, you can say. Yeah. But Britain had already promised to Australia and other colonies <laughs> these lands and told Japan that they're not allowed to have them. And then all of a sudden, oh, we need Japan to help us in the Mediterranean. Oh, well, here are your lands that you wanted that we were so adamantly against you having a year prior. <laughs> Well, the, so, the one in the one in question that Britain was kind of being iffy about was Shandong province, uh, where Tsingtao is. The colonies mm -hmm. in the Pacific, basically, the Japanese were told, like, you don't go take any of these islands mm -hmm. because, you know, New Zealand and uh, Australia are going to get them. And as we'll see in World War II, um, telling a government something and the actual commanders in the field are uh, two different things. So <laughs> the Navy just well, went ahead and attacked. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I, your video was amazing about that. That, but the the admiral was specifically told, "Don't occupy these islands," and immediately he occupied the islands. And then he he did eventually pull out after being told by his government to you know get the hell out of there. But it's just really funny to show like even in World War One, I, I know I was talking about before like the difference between the two, but you can see that there is still some of that building World War Two ideology in the military in World War One, where you have these generals just go against um, um, the, the government who laid out a specific um, guidelines for these actions. And then you just have them saying, screw those guidelines. I'm taking this island. I have the military force to do it. Yeah. And then... And the government at this time isn't simply the military, whereas in World War Two, it's it's yes. more or less, it's just the military. So in World War One, you you still have what's um, kind of like Showa politics. Well, I'm not even sure. It's it's, it's sure. civilian politics. There was still a yeah. lot happening. It's like, almost it's at had, the cusp of not being, but yeah. It the best way I can like it's not a great example, but um, the the German Republic is a good example of that democracy where it's a a new form of democracy. And the population still uneasy about it, and they're still trying to find their like political power base. The same things happening in Japan. Like these are this democracy is new to Japan, so they are trying to in this period, like create this government, find out like what are how this government works, how are we going to do it, and all that. But at the same time, you have this military power base that's slowly, slowly trying to chip away at the government to take away this power that they were given in the, in their constitution. And then of course, World War II comes along and how they get around that, they just put military personnel in the government. So they've never broken the constitution. They've just merely filled every position with loyalists. Well, you, you, one, one thing about Japan is the constitution back then wasn't like constitutions of other uh, countries. You know, I, I think this comes into a period too where Japan is just so uh-oh. We're lagging out <laughs> oh, again. Yeah, you're in a very uh, contemplated look right now. Like you're thinking hard about Japan. But uh, yeah, just to, oh, I'll just carry on. Yeah, uh, yeah, in Japan, the constitution didn't actually give power to the people. It invested the power of the people into the emperor. So the emperor was actually like the spokesperson of the rights of the people. So it's a little different when it comes to the constitution. But it also wasn't really democratic either. It had the illusion of being democratic, whereas it wasn't really representative of the people, we'll say. It was more of an oligarchy. Are you, anything. Really? 
because it's I always more thought confusing than that, but yeah, yeah, like because this is not my specialty, of course, in history. I just know a bit about it, but I always did thought like when the emperor did establish this new constitution and all that, the people were given the vote. Were they not given the vote, or was the vote just for show? Uh, the vote was only given to certain people who had certain amounts of land, so kind of uh, like uh, oh, what's you know, like when the Americans had that, like at the beginning yeah. of the dawn of the voting age. It's a little bit like that at the beginning, and then it fell into something else, and then it was all appointed officials. Eventually, the emperor has quasi power, but it's not. We, no one really knows how much power the emperor has, and he can appoint officials, and he can disband any cabinet, like he can mm-hmm. dissolve it at will. That is in the constitution. It's a lot more weird than that. But when it comes to World War One, it's also kind of a, another turning of the times for Japan because soon they're gonna have uh, they have like another emperor. He doesn't last very long. He's very incompetent. They're yeah, things are kind of falling apart for Japan during World War One. Hmm. Sorry, boys, think I'm back. No, no problem. Uh, no, Justin, so yeah. Justin, you have any questions uh, about the episode? Uh, I did actually. There was a few things that piqued my interest. Uh, one of which being, you, you mentioned that uh, at a certain point you had Japanese naval ships going around the coast of basically what is Canada and Vancouver, British Columbia, yeah. to escort Canadian transports and stuff. But there hasn't really been any other mention of what Canada's participation is or how important whatever was being transported was. So, so what brought about this 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 aid from Japan to stop uh, German bombardment in Canada? So the, the Laurier government, when it came into power in Canada, was asked by uh, the Commonwealth well, of Britain. Britain asked, you know, we need you to do something about the Navy. Are you going to, like, allow us to develop it for you? Are you going to purchase, do this or that? And the decision of the Laurier cabinet was to uh, develop the Navy on its own. It was not really popular because it was expensive. And it kind of resulted, it's not that it resulted in us not having a lot of ships, but when World War One came about, we could only really focus on the Atlantic because we had to consolidate our entire Navy. And the Atlantic was 90, 90% of like, you know, the Allied transport. What, what was happening in the Pacific other than Australia and the Indian Ocean, it's not that significant when the German Raiders are gone. Well, so- yeah, just in case people don't, just to go quickly, all of the supplies and all that, that were needed were needed in europe like yeah. all that fighting going on every single soldier you had to equip with munitions you had to equip with uh, gear you had to tr- transport you need gas you needed ships like and this all didn't come from europe like in a sense especially in the british empire a lot of their natural resources were spread out across the globe it wasn't like it was all in england they had to bring in from all their colonies in the Pacific and Africa, like rubber, fuel, cotton, um, and other uh, steel and that, they had to actually transport it. So that's why you had in the Pacific going through Canada, because you had these uh, convoys coming from the Pacific going through Canada to be then shipped towards um, Europe. That's why Canada was an important naval country in World War II especially, but in World War I the same, was merely because there was a early form of globalization in the sense that you had different commodities being shipped from all across the globe to different areas. And that's how England survived as an empire. It exploited the resources out of all these colonies, sometimes quite harshly, but that's how they were able to fight World War I so efficiently. And they were the only country that after World War I that came out kind of stronger than the other people was because its empire remained intact and it had this abundance of resources. And that's why they were kept pushing for Japan and Canada and it's all these other colonies to protect these shipping lanes. If these, if the Germans managed to throw those U-boats or the raiding parties into unprotected convoy lanes, they could severely hurt the European theater because Britain was also funding France. It was funding all its allies during this time. Like France did have an empire, but nothing compared to England. It did not have the natural resources that England had. That is why, like you were saying, Laurier, they had England was almost going to pay Canada to have a navy because it knew 
how important those shipping lanes were to its survival. Plus, that's why it, Japan there's a big interest in loaning that money. Like let's Britain was gonna make more money off that deal. That's why mm-hmm. Lori didn't go for it. But yeah. No one does anything for free. And no one England, they're probably gonna send us like 30 year old destroyers. Yes, and, of course. Which is it just not just England, but America does it too. It just seems like their form of help is just pawning off their garbage munitions yeah, <laughs> to other much. countries but uh, to answer, probably, um, it's probably better than the 10 canoes that the canadian uh, navy currently has so no, we have frigates and destroyers it's not bad we our navy is pretty uh, pretty good yeah and what it is yes our frigates are getting a little more dated but our frigates used to be some of the most modern frigates yeah. in the world the um halifax class i think it is or i'm not that good with the modern navy so uh, it's something with an h but Anyways, and we, we are building a whole new Navy. The only thing is, like Laurier, it's a lot of money, and the people aren't too excited that Canada yeah. wants to build, I think it's 33 new frigates, um, but merely to protect the Arctic, because let's be honest, if that's we don't... What we're, yeah, it's our game right now. I mean, what yeah, else are we going to be? If we don't, then we have to turn to the U.S., and once we do that, we lose like we are, we're, we're already in their sphere. If we give them the Arctic... We're just Austria to Germany at that point. <laughs> Jeez, pretty much. Uh, but yeah, to, it harshly, but to answer Justin's question a bit more fully, I thought this question would come about, and I had to look into it because it was it was a very minor little like I think I put two sentences in the episode. There was a it's one little special task force called like the North American Task Force. I even have notes here. It's in Japanese. It's the Kenbei Shitai, and it seems to me calling it a task force is kind of odd because i could only find like two cruisers Mm -hmm. were basically patrolling what is vancouver and then i looked into it a bit further and what i found was something kind of interesting the british requested that the ign send two cruisers from vladivostok to vancouver to assist in the transport of gold bullion okay so i'm gonna take a wild guess given what was going on in russia that perhaps the um, the funds were, you know, insurance policies <laughs> basically getting sent out of Russia because of a certain revolution that was going to take mm. part. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. I did not know that's I, I always wondered what because isn't there like a whole mythology on not the drools of Russia, but like just the uh, the wealth of the czars like wasn't it like apparently they hid it away somewhere and yeah, people yeah, go on treasure hunts nowadays oh, to yeah, try yeah, and find it the... theories about it yeah 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 but like that bullion really adds not to the conspiracy i find that's garbage but the whole idea that russia did get out all of as much as they could their of valuables course. and all that because I, I always did wonder like what did the soviets inherit when they took over did they inherit any type of treasury or was it just they inherited a civil war <laughs> yes they did <laughs> quite the brutal one on top of that yep. quite the uh, one where there was no good sides in that war <laughs> they were all just vicious yeah. and anyways now that that's a that's another video <laughs> you have any other questions justin well g- g- getting on that topic too it seemed like uh, at one point japan was uh, pretty ready to throw their uh, their hat in the mix when it came to that conflict but uh what i was wondering is you know you you mentioned how they originally requested japan send seven thousand troops Mm -hmm. and within a very short period of time they're sitting with seventy thousand troops in that area do you think japan was actually preparing to jump into the conflict physically or do you think it was just a show of force to maybe try to get people to back off you know, they, they absolutely did jump in. What what was called the Siberian intervention was basically all the great powers, except for uh, the central powers, because they were still at war, were asked to bring a bunch of forces each to help put down the Red Army, because the White Army was trying to secure Russia. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. everybody had an agreed, like, how much men you're going to send. And, like, yeah, Japan was supposed to send something like 7,000. They sent, like, 70,000. <laughs> Good old Japan. It, what, it, what it was, was the IGA was always talking about creating a buffer state. So they wanted to secure kind of what's southern Siberia near Lake Bacal. And that's always, that's even the same plan in World War II. It's what they wanted. So when this all came about, they were like, oh, this is the best situation ever. Look, all these allies are bringing men into Vladivostok and all this. We're not going to let them do this all willy nilly. So what was supposed to be like a UN international force under, you know, a loose command of all these different nations. Japan's like, no, we're taking command of everything. And uh, we're just going to bring like 50,000 settlers 
So they start populating all these areas. They start, you know, building economic outposts and all the areas they can. They actually get to Lake Bacal. They pretty much complete their entire occupation of what they want. They even defeat the Red Army, taking pretty heavy casualties, mind you, but they're dishing out double the amount of casualties upon the Russians. And I mean, the Russians, it's going to be hard to fight a fresh army like that. But right. they didn't foresee political problems based on what they were doing. And eventually they just kind of have to, what they're doing is filibustering. If you know what that is back in the old days, like when you just kind of move people into a territory and then you just call it your own and say, well, we have so many people living here that, you know, it's ours. Maybe you should explain that a little more just because I know a lot of you viewers oh, might hear filibustering yeah. and they're going to say, oh, okay. why, why are they standing in Congress just talking for hours? Yeah. <laughs> so for, for, for the American audience, I mean, Americans should know this, like Texas is, a, it, Texas is what was filibustering, like a bunch of people just inhabited Texas, even though it was owned by the Mexican government. And then they're like, oh, well, we're, we're Texans now and like get out of here. And then it becomes part of the United States. Basically, the idea was a bunch of people move in and they just occupy a place kind of illegally, but no one bothered to do anything about it. And you can kind of get away with it later is the only way I can put it. But uh, yeah, the Japanese, they, it doesn't work out. They get really beaten up by the Red Army. But I mean, like, it was nothing to say that they were losing a war or anything. But when the Japanese leaders had to look at the politics, when it looked like the White Army was done and that the Bolsheviks were going to control this new country, which was going to be the USSR, the Japanese were saying to themselves, OK, we don't want to actually be at war with a country. Because until that point, they were just fighting, we'll call them insurgents, even though it's a large population. That's why they pulled out. And then it's ironic because they're going to fight that same battle in World War II. It's what they were doing for the next like 20 years, honestly. Yeah. yeah but... all... Okay, go, go on, Justin. Yeah, no, I was just going to say it, it almost seems kind of the same way as what Japan was doing to China in the early yeah. in the early thing. Whereas, you know, they, they see all the civil wars going on. They see, a, they see a country a little bit fractured and they figure, well, while this is going on, I'll just go in and pick up a few crumbs and take a slice of the pie for myself. Exactly. You know, so uh... it was. I mean, they were in Shandong. Uh, they were promised by Britain, much like many other countries during World War One, where Britain just promised everything to everybody. Britain just giving yeah. away a bunch of shit that doesn't belong, belong to, them. to them. And yeah. then when when the time comes, England's like, nah. Well, the best is when Britain promises the same place to two different countries, <laughs> and then Britain's like, oh, hmm. Well, this is Wait, awkward. Are, are you talking about Lawrence of Arabia? <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can have your own town. Yeah, you can have your own country. Okay. Yeah, you can have your own country. All right, let's all meet at the summit table. Yeah, you're none of you are getting your own country. We're taking this over. Brent's like, I don't know you. We've never spoken before. <laughs> like making Lawrence of Arabia. Why for... were... I said, Lawrence, why won't you say anything? I had no idea this was going to happen. No one told me that. I was merely leading you guys in, in, in this direction just to get your help. Uh, actually, uh, throw to Eric. Do you have any questions? Uh, not that I think so far how we're going. I'm really enjoying this. We're just, it's a free forum conversation about Japan. And yes, it does seem hard to stay focused in World War One just because Japan is so interesting you just naturally want to bring in all the other time periods and uh to explain what's happening this way even going into the future to say well look what's going to happen in japan in the future kind of thing it's yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a fascinating topic well because no like... one thinks about japan in world yeah. war one especially from canada i guess in asia very oh, different yeah. in asia but... japan is basically what we see britain as it's just, yeah. you know yeah. yeah and i think it's rightfully so knowing the history of japan we we really can't be like yeah they were the colonizer of that region it's just <laughs> england did it more successfully for longer <laughs> kind of true it yeah i did, well, have, I did on. have one more question though if eric uh if yeah, eric didn't on. have any loaded up no uh, I haven't, i'm good yeah, because we were, uh, you talked a little bit about the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. And while that is a very notable event, and we did study it a bit, even in our history mm -hmm. classes, uh, you know, from a North American perspective, but I found it interesting when you got into these, uh, whether you call them modifications, amendments, whatever Japan wanted to put into the Treaty of Versailles, particularly yeah. the racial equality. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is how exactly did that work, where it seems to be like a, 
a group consensus or a group vote, and yet the U.S. <laughs> just comes in and basically vetoes it and says, "Yeah, no, you're not getting that." It, Wait, it's how, so how, how does that work? It, it, it's really messed up and kind of complicated because there was no rules or regulations yeah. for, for this. This was, you know, a de facto one of the first times he did something like this in this format. I mean, they had like the treaties of Westphalia and all that in the back of the past, but this was like the first time an organized body, a united league, had come about. Basically, what happened, like I say in the episode, they have a vote and it was unanimous, but there were certain diplomats who weren't present or voted not present which you know you can see in congress today it's kind of like a political move to not take a stance and there was politics at play within the internal the internal politics of other countries so take a country like england take australia and take the united states the ones who had the biggest issue with the idea of the racial equality was australia because australia had a policy that was ongoing called uh white Australia only. It was just like restricting um, immigration in Australia to only be from places they like, because obviously uh, most of Asia would immigrate to Australia. It's just, it's right there, right? It's local. And okay, yeah. Much like Canada had no whites. Uh, what was it? No, it was no blacks in the West was a policy we once took. So no Asians in the West. Well, that was a, a Chinese a... exclusionary acts, but we actually yeah. had a policy. It was called like the no blacks in the West policy, even though there wasn't many Black people immigrating to Canada at that point, which always, well, it's all other story, but these racist immigration policies were. It just seems reality. like if, if you're a part of England, you have to go through a phase of being the shittiest place in the world for yeah. minorities. Well, I mean, people of color, like, ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, that's the one thing I did when studying history. You really do realize just, God damn, we did a lot of shitty things in the past. Yeah, the only difference between Canada and the United States is we couldn't grow cotton. And that's why we just didn't have a large plantation. Yeah. That's really like, the only difference, yeah. Like, because and you uh, can't give, let's hypothetically, you can't give a slave a musket and say, go hunt some beavers and all that, because the yeah. slave's just going to turn around and shoot you with it. And that in early Canadian history, when slavery yeah, pretty was much. pretty rampant in the U.S., Canada had very few... Uh, exports or resource commodities because well the weather was pretty goddamn harsh in canada yeah, at, at the timber, time you know until the oil industry picked up but anyways not but, to get off topic yeah we're a little what, off topic what happened with the vote to brutally summarize so the leader of uh, australia he immediately makes the argument that he doesn't want this to go through because of the white australia policy okay that's one matter it's an individual country woodrow wilson who Eric, you probably know he's a controversial figure to say the least. Yeah, I see. I'm so on the fence with the controversy because there is, it's like you have two camps. One camp is this guy was the worst president to ever, ever take the Exist. presidency. Like, I don't throughout, think the worst, but out this, there, top three worst. Yeah, merely, and because their main point is look what he did for the US. He put the US on a tra trajectory to where it is today. In that it's um, it's an interventionist policy. Yeah. It's of a U.S. first policy. Whereas prior to Wilson, it really was more of an isolationist, and not only isolationist, more of a. Uh, I would say Teddy Roosevelt kind of broke that isolationist period a little bit, but anyway, well, not to go off. Yeah, track. yeah, but like, and then, but at the same time, Woodrow Wilson, World War One, he did push for the League of Nations. This was his child yeah it's and it wasn't so necessarily be, him yeah. who killed it it was congress and the senate who voted it out yes. yes it's not necessarily all his fault but still will joe wilson just for, for I, i'm sure american audience members know this will joe wilson i think we can all say uh given the standards of his day and age was a racist not of our standards like in his day yeah wow he, i mean he was a huge supporter of the kkk uh he had the, the what was the film uh the kkk film like he oh, showed it was, in the White House. Yeah, it was the Birth first. Of a nation. Birth of a nation. Yeah, not just that. It was the first ever movie created. Yeah, just to but anyway, throw so that out there. Woodrow Wilson, um, when he was thinking in terms of how he's going to go about the racial equality proposal, he was only thinking about politics at home. As you can imagine, at that time, <laughs> politics at home, there was yeah. issues of race and slavery and such. So the racial equality proposal stirred up that kind of politics. 
the thing is the japanese stipulated when they wrote it because they weren't stupid that it was only for members of like the league and that so there was ambiguity it was ambiguous how it was going to work but if the united states signed on the united states was going to have to uphold some of it and the united states wasn't going to do that so woodrow wilson was looking for a reason to shut it down and the australians gave him a really good reason and he really drilled them on that the japanese go and they talk to the australians and then they, they tell them look it's not going to mess with the white australian policy we'll have like barriers from Asians coming in your country, whatever. So Australia even gets on board and the guy agrees he'll sign off. It's only Americans at the end and the British somewhat. The British have hard feelings about it, but the British felt that they couldn't say anything because of the alliance they had with Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, France, I think, and Italy were supporting the hell out of it, which was weird. Uh, actually, not yeah. from, from France's point of view. I understand Fr France would obviously support it, but I Italy well, France, was a weird one. Yeah. Well, France for the Treaty of Versailles, their own, well, not their <laughs> only, but the one thing they wanted out of it was Pound of flesh. Germany. Yeah, they were like, Germany will never do this again. Like France, like where England wanted to see more of a future of like, okay, we need cooperation. We need like to grow now as a planet kind of. Well, not, I know that's very simplistic. I know that's more, a lot more to it, but the US and England were more of a, we, we need to contain Germany, but at the same time, we can't, destroy germany because that would lead to a lot more issues where france was like fuck germany look what they just did to me for four years on my ground my my soldiers are the one that died like england you sent a lot over us you sent a lot but... justin you're like breathing so heavily into the mic <laughs> oh <my laughs> are you really upset bad. about france yeah, just sorry. justin there like yes is he yes. talking about france is he talking about oh france Oh, you better bad, not be guys. talking about France. But uh, to, to finish off the conversation, yeah. the way that Woodrow Wilson, like I say in the episode, how he kind of gets off it, he goes, oh, well, we don't have a majority vote because, you know, not everybody was in the room. And then Japan's like, can everybody just say that it was a majority vote? And like France and Italy and a bunch of them say, yes, of course. And they still go, no, no, for, for, this is such an important topic, which Wilson says that unlike all the other ones we're voting for, we can't really do this one. And then it just gets, you know, <laughs> swept under the rug and, it's one of the biggest reasons why Japan goes to war World War II. It's, it's one well, yeah. of the biggest smears against And them. I'm pretty sure they didn't wait for everyone to decide the limits of capital ships than the limits of military force and all that. I'm pretty sure uh, the U.S. and England didn't wait for, oh, we need to get a vote from everyone to decide how strong we can make everyone else's military. And I don't say it in the episode because I don't know all the history about it. I'm not a specialist on Ethiopia, but the kingdom of Ethiopia, which was technically like a great power at the time, they were hella pissed off about this one <laughs> and they got this really um i think this implicated the future of ethiopia as we know it today if i'm not mistaken this is one of the crucial points that actually hurt the kingdom uh is there yeah. any other questions i'm looking at time here not for me i thought you had some audience questions though, yeah that's but... why because yeah, yeah, yeah. let's to... jump into them let's jump in i i can talk all day if i want need all right uh before i get in the audience questions i'll just say this uh to the, any because no one asked these questions but i know that maybe some people were curious i could only put so much in the episode obviously so i had to cut back on two kind of big issues uh one i, I talked a lot about about was uh, the shangdong problem so you know japan gets promised that they're going to control shangdong by britain but then when world war one comes to a close you know china is absolutely furious at the whole situation china ends up getting shangdong back in 1922 and there's another treaty signed, which is the Nine Powers Treaty, but Japan still controls the economic influence of the area of Shangdong. And this causes like a heap load of problems. So for people who are looking for like, how does World War One cause World War II? This specific issue is a very important one because Japan had so many economic assets in Shangdong and, and a few other places in China that when, uh, you, when um, Chiang Kai-shek performs his Northern Expedition, in 27 and 28 basically when they come into the area japan had a reason to bring their military and intervene which leads to things like the jinan incident and other things that create world war ii in asia as we see it so i thought like i couldn't say that in the episode because i'll do a whole series on the warlord era later but obviously that was a an issue and when i mentioned the may 4th movement there's no way i can talk about it because it's way way there's too much like i have to actually make a whole episode about it but obviously in this episode, the Shangdong pro problem, the 21 demands and all that leads to the May 4th movement and the, you know, the expelling of pro-Japanese officials and the boycotting of Japan within China. 
and like how China kind of raises its nationalism where and even when communism kind of gets birthed all this happens this will be another episode probably after the world war one series but i just wanted to get that out of the way before i do questions because i know people are like probably wondering about that uh first right. question and sometimes i write these down i don't even think about them they might be just comments let's see first question what are your plans for future episodes now that you're collaborating with kings and generals for the coverage of the pacific war in world war ii do you still plan to make videos covering the war on this channel? Oh, yes. good question. <laughs> yes, good I, question. I, I, I do plan on continuing this channel, but you've hit the nail on the head. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, can't talk about much of what's going to be happening because I'm under an NDA, but uh, there's, there's so many more projects going on with Kings and Generals in me than even the Pacific War. I'm part of other projects. I'm not going to stop this channel. I'm just not going to have as much time with this channel. I'm not going to lie. I work every single day for them. Uh, it's to hell of a job ongoing right now. I'm creating some craziness. I mean, you can see there's a whole other podcast, which is amazing in its own, but something will be happening on this channel and a sneak peek. I'm probably going to go more heavy into movie anime reviews, things res about the Pacific war. Uh, talk about literature. I'm still going to do the episodes and the future of this podcast is kind of like up in the air. We'll see how it goes because I can see that there's a demand for some kind of podcast, but I don't know if this is meeting the demand, but it's going to continue in some some format. Uh, second question. I do wonder after this how the other yes voting countries reacted to Wilson's claim about the racial equality needed a unanimous vote. Why did they agree while their vote was being ignored? Well, actually, we kind of answered this just before. Um, France was angry. Ethiopia would have been furious if they were involved at all in that talk. Uh, Italy wasn't happy. Italy stormed out during the Treaty of Versailles, of course, for other reasons. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it came down to Wilson really kind of bullying everybody. And Wilson was a bully. Uh, everyone hated him at the, uh, <laughs> at the, U at the not the UN, at the yeah. um, League of Nations. League of Nations, because he came off as this like know-it-all kind of snob. And he was. He he really did come he off. He was as a idealistic. That's yeah. why there was this huge controversy around Wilson. A lot of people didn't like him because he didn't know how to talk to people. He he was yeah. like above an intellect. He was like being too much of an intellectual for everyone around him. And he like he even pissed off the British. They didn't yeah, well, like it's because he had in his mind he had this idea, this let's say dream yeah. of what the world was going to look like through the League of Nations. And he didn't want to accept the reality of the situation that other nations have other priorities and what you want for your nation isn't what France is going to want or England's going to want. So when he went in there, like talking about, we need to do this and that, we need the League of Nations and that. And they were like, well, what about this and this? He was like, no, you guys don't understand. We need to do this. He was, yeah. oh, he and, couldn't uh, see past his own perspective. I actually didn't even mention this. Uh, another, per another nation that was super angry about this was China. China and Japan agreed on this one issue, and uh, it definitely angered China. That's rare. And Chiang Kai-shek, yeah. you know, I think he even noted it later on in history that it was a terrible moment, and it just showed how Britain, at, like in Chiang Kai-shek's diaries, he would write like how Britain was too old-fashioned; they couldn't get over the racial question. Mm -hmm. Well, because you know, the United States does get over it during the period between World War One and Two, despite what people might think of history. The United States gets pretty progressive by by world war ii standards yeah uh third question it's ironic that germany was the main enemy of japan in world war one and that the usa was the main enemy of japan in world war ii wait what can you say the first part again yeah i read that the right way okay it, it says it's ironic that germany was the main enemy of japan in world war one and that the oh, usa okay. was the main enemy although the usa was an enemy of japan during world war one it's just when the United States enters the war, they're forced to be allies. They didn't want to be. Yeah. Neither country trusted each other. Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting even more for China. China and Germany declare, well, you know, China declares war on Germany as well. But right after World War One ends, Germany is China's best friend, helps train the military, gives them technology, really yeah. helps their industry. You know, um, what happens in war doesn't necessarily dictate what happens later. Uh, Germany yeah. and Russia before World War II doing secret alliances and buddy-buddy stuff. You know, you don't know. Oh, yeah. Look at uh, Bismarck. He he managed to get Russia and France 
on the same page with him to yeah. the annoyance of England. Like, it just goes to show, like, what happens a decade before might not be what the decade after. And like yeah. you said, Germany and China. The only reason Germany stopped helping China was because Japan, eventually Germany, uh, Japan pressured Germany so much into uh, World War II and that because it was going on that Germany had to pull out its supports and all that because let's be honest, you're, you're out, Japan and Germany were allies and then you have German advisors training Chinese, the Chinese army, which is fighting Japan at that moment. So I mean, it does kind of look bad too. Like they, they yeah. supplied them with World War One equipment, but it was good by that standard. It oh was yeah, good enough. Any well, like German. A lot of world when World War Two first started, most of the equipment from most of the nations, except in a few, were World War One equipment. Like yeah, after true. World War One, most countries were in massive debt. They didn't have the money to modernize throughout time. I mean, look at France. God, they were using. Uh, fa uh, technology from the late 20s and early 30s by the time World War II broke out. Like, yeah, they whereas, didn't have radios in their tanks. <laughs> yeah, it was Germany that modernized the fastest, and that's because Germany was repressed for so long yeah. that when they finally just said, fuck it, they just went full hard in the military, and they had no one telling them they can't do it anymore. So they just completely mm -hmm. modernized. But even then, look how fast the other nations modernized. And then they overshot Germany. And then Germany be became the one with outdated equipment going up against U.S., or actually mostly just the U.S., and Russian technology. England kind of lagged in World War II with their technology, like their military equipment. Well, radar and uh, code breaking, they were the top. Yes, yes. Top but like their, their like hardware, like their tanks, their rifles well, and all that. Yeah. I mean, they, they never. Were very like, but they have to. They put everything into their navy. I mean, like they've never had yeah. great tanks to begin with. So, I mean, uh, last, yeah, anyway, yeah. So, last yeah, question, I, uh, and it's not even. Uh, actually, I, I made a note here. This is in response to a community post I made last week, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, about the whole anime thing. I asked. I asked the audience if they'd be cool with me doing some reviews of animes that were uh, related to the Pacific War. So I didn't want to like go off topic, but I wanted to get into like different kind of territory one person said i can't wait for your reviews in anime for world war ii like movies such as the wind rises and in this corner of the world well i haven't seen either of those i've seen um barefoot gen yeah and uh, well the number good. one is um grave uh graveyard of the fireflies is the number yes one. i've seen both of those two those well, are the ones the, i was going to do but uh, I think those are good ones to start with. with. And then you can do those. It's just because I feel like those two are the like poster childs of those They're anime definitely. movies. So it's, it's a good way to start. Like I, when I watched them too, I was blown away. Cause I was like, Oh, it's anime, you know, but when you watch it, it's like, horrifying. It's, yeah, it's rough. It, the fact that it was anime made it even more horrifying. Cause they could depict all the things they you can't do it with like a live action movie and you're just yeah. there at the end like holy I, I didn't realize like like not nuclear bomb but even though one of them was on the nuclear bomb just firebombing like how horrific that was that yeah. no one talks about the u.s and they did it to multiple cities they just firebombed them and no one talks about it and they and i know it's war and war is hell but it just seems like holy fuck that tokyo went to an extreme and Dres tokyo and dresden some of the worst yeah. places in the world that time I, I your brother i don't know if it was ever on the podcast but he he had to read a book where they were talking about a situation in dresden where people were told to go into bomb shelters and what ended up happening is the fire bombs hit the ground level and created such a heat that the people that were in the shelters got boiled alive and when people had yeah. to go look into them they found just human sludge it's like oh, that's not night, fun. nightmare nightmare fuel basically and, and tokyo is yeah. the same tokyo is even worse because everything you yeah. do a lot it's made out of wood so it just, just kindling yeah. for everything and they just i forget what the percentage was but like most of tokyo was gone yeah. and it didn't help like the allies justification for this was because uh japanese industry was decentralized meaning yes. it's not like it's true it was like some there were there were some warehouses and like manufacturing shops like any country but majority of it 
was spread out across people's households and all that. And people like were just building the parts in their houses and all that with simple tools and that, and then yep. shipping it off. They would bring so the like US, an airplane wing yeah. over a mountain range using a mule and ox cart sometimes from yep. some other place. And then, cause that, that was, the, they didn't have like a proper centralized industry either for it. Japan took a long time to build everything they built. Unlike and the United then, States. Yeah. And then the US was just like, well, we have to bomb their industry and their industry is their population. So somehow the US found justification along well, with England that like, well, if we bomb their cities, well, then they won't be able to build anything. Kurt, Curtis LeMay had his own views on how to win a war, we'll say. Much like, uh, uh, what's the name of the British? Yeah, uh, Harrison or Harris or... Yeah. Uh, they, they were both two guys that yeah. got a lot of flack later on. But I mean, like, you can question well, morality, it won the war, but yeah. But at the end of the day, it did win. The, the The U.S. crippled Japan's economy so much by doing this. They did win it. It's just morality-wise, it's like, holy fuck. At the same, like the, the British guy, this was, I remember learning about this in college. My, my teacher was telling me that when he was at the officer's club, and all the officers were talking and all that stuff. And they were saying, oh, well, my battalions, we just took out 125 Germans yeah, today, blah, blah, yeah. or stuff like that. And then Harrison comes along and he's just there like, really? Well, my bombers just killed 5,000 civilians in one night. And we're going to go again tomorrow. Just, so like, yeah, and but he also did explain, well, like this was written in a letter and with context, he might've said it differently. You know, we can't actually know the merits of it, but it just goes to show the mentality of that war was just we need to finish this as fast as possible win at the, all costs yeah because the longer it goes on the actual worse is going to be so even though it's horrendous now if we keep this going on for six more years you're going to see what it's really brutal and that was that was tangent and, uh, and stating half. stating that i think we, i don't know i think we did go over time uh it's been great to have you both on. Yeah. Uh, there's only going to let the audience know there is actually one more World War One episode. I'm just editing it, and it took me the most time to research for. It's much more niche. Southeast Asia during World War One, or Southeast Asians during World War One. It's not actually. It's about their participation. You're gonna get that soon, uh, and there'll be a following podcast. And after that, we're jumping off a cliff. I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Maybe Warlord episode. I don't know. Uh, thank Can't you both wait. for being here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. It's been fun as usual, and uh, take care, guys. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Pacific War Channel, over and out.